Ancient people were obsessed with death and created death gods to be honored and feared. Here are some of the most powerful death gods from mythology. Let's see how many you already know. Hades. Hades is the one god of death that pretty much everybody in the world knows by name. He was the Greek ruler of the underworld, and his name was so famous that the word Hades became synonymous with the afterlife. It even appears in the Bible. When the four horsemen of the apocalypse ride, the pale rider of death is followed by Hades. But who was Hades really to the Greeks? His name translates roughly to mean the unseen one. That's because he was the king of the invisible world, the world of spirits. Then, somewhere along the line, the Greeks started using his name interchangeably with the realm of the underworld, and that's why you hear Hades mentioned as a god, and Hades mentioned as the realm itself. The god Hades ruled over the place known as Hades. As the supreme commander of the Greek underworld, Hades was a ghoulish figure. There are very few artistic representations of Hades from classical Greece because he terrified people. The few depictions of him that have survived show a distinguished man with a mournful soul solemn look, sporting a thick beard and wearing a gnarled helmet. He was also typically depicted alongside his three-headed dog Cerberus, which guarded the entrance to the world of the deceased. He also wielded a bident, like Poseidon's trident, but with only two prongs. The myths involving Hades are numerous. It would take me a really long time to go through all the various legends from Greek mythology that he was involved in, but the most important thing to know is that Hades was the older brother of Zeus and Poseidon, and the younger brother of Hestia. Demeter, and Hera. He was born from the Titans Cronus and Rhea. Then, after the Titans were defeated, the three Olympian brothers divided the world among themselves. Zeus became king of Olympus and ruler of the surface, Poseidon became the god of the sea, and Hades was stuck in the infernal realm ruling over the underworld. Suffice to say, he wasn't particularly happy about it. Living down in the dank and dark realm of souls wasn't a fun time. Hades was desperate for a wife. Lonely with only a three-headed dog for company. After all, the dating scene in Greek hell is far from great. Hades' most important myth involves his abduction of his very own sister's daughter, whom he would force to be his wife. Hades kidnapped Persephone, the daughter of Demeter, the goddess of life. And when he kidnapped Persephone, Demeter was so distressed that she stopped bringing life into the world. This resulted in winter, with the earth barren and infertile. It was a big problem for the world and a big concern for Zeus. After some negotiations, Hades agreed that Persephone would spend half the year with him in the underworld and the other half of the year on the surface with her mother. This was how Greeks explained winter and summer. While Persephone was with Hades, Demeter was depressed and all the plants died. But when Persephone was given back, Demeter ushered in the spring. Masawu. For the Hopi Native Americans, there was no god more frightening than the Skeleton Man. The Skeleton Man was Masawu, the god of death. But even though he lorded over the dead, he wasn't entirely evil. Although his physical appearance was frightening at times, he wasn't always a terrifying monster. Masawu was a god of two faces. He was described as either horribly hideous or extremely handsome. Sometimes he was a ghoulish skeleton looking like a zombie risen from the grave. But other times he came to the Hopi as an ordinary man seeking friendship. The one thing that really separates Masawu from the death gods of other cultures is that he isn't inherently bad. In most civilizations across the world, death gods were seen as evil beings who reveled in destruction and chaos. But for the Hopi, Masawu was a friend. He had to be trusted since he was the one looking after their people in the afterlife. The Hopi desperately wanted to continue their lives after death, and they wanted their lives to be good. So, it was important to them that they could trust their gods to take care of them in the next world. But they couldn't just slouch through life doing nothing and expect to be taken care of in the afterlife. If somebody wanted a luxurious stay in the underworld, they needed to practice a righteous life on the surface. And for the Hopi, this meant being good farmers. Practicing good agricultural techniques meant that the skeleton man would look after them when they died. It's the same idea of being a good person and going to heaven instead of hell. Only for the Hopi, everyone went to the same place, and the amount of goodness they found there depended on how useful they were to society during their lifetime. 
Hel. In Norse mythology, Hel is the name of the Lord of Death. But the Vikings didn't worship a man of the underworld. Their god of death was a goddess. Hel was the keeper of the dead, the monarch of darkness and misery, and she was feared and respected by all those who knew her name. Her pale skin and sleek figure were enough to strike terror into the hearts of anyone who saw her. There are a lot of ancient stories about the Norse death goddess. She was said to watch over the spirits of evil. She supposedly enjoyed reveling in misery and suffering, and she loved her power, often using it to make mortal lives worse. Hel's position in the Norse pantheon was as the gatekeeper of the realm of Helheim. She was the one who received the spirits of the dead and guided them down into the underworld. Her role was very similar to the role of Osiris in Egyptian mythology. Osiris was also in charge of the underworld, but in Egypt it was called Duat. The Norse realm of Helheim was believed to be a terrible place. It can most closely be compared to the Christian version of Hel. It wasn't a place for everyone who died, though. Helheim was reserved for the damned. Those who lived less than righteous lives were forced to spend the rest of eternity reflecting on the mistakes they'd made. It was basically a realm of regret and hindsight, with the tormented stuck in an endless pit of self-loathing and self-reflection. And ruling over all of it was the gloomy goddess, the Mayan death gods. The realm of death was a very complex thing for the Maya. On the Yucatan Peninsula, the Maya believed in a place called Xibalba. In English, the word translates to place of fear. So it was far more than just an underworld. It was a place of death, darkness, and horror. It was such a despicable realm that it couldn't be ruled over by a single god. There were many lords of Xibalba, each one more disturbing than the last. The most important god when it came to death and destruction was Apuch. He was the legitimate god of death, representing decomposition, rot, and the end of life. He was depicted in Mayan art as a skeletal figure. He had protruding ribs or would be drawn bloated, suggestive of a decomposing corpse. Sometimes he was given an owl head, as owls to the Maya were closely associated with death. And in the Mayan underworld, Apuch ruled the lowest level called Mithal. Next was the god Kamatsots. Depending on how you want to interpret this terrifying god, he was either the Mayan version of Batman or or a Mayan vampire. He was always depicted as a bat. Mayan lore says he lived in the deepest levels of Xibalba, places where no light ever shone. He was also notorious for decapitating people. It was kind of his thing. Zipacna and Cabracan were demonic brothers of the underworld. They were Mayan versions of demons. They were arrogant, violent, and ruthless. Zipakna was typically drawn as a man inside of an alligator. He and his brother were monstrous killers who massacred people in their homes and dragged them down into the depths of Mayan hell. Governing Xibalba was Yum Kimil, the god of death. Historians believe that Yum Kimil was likely the same god as Apuch, just under a different name. He was one of the most powerful and most feared gods of the Maya. He had total dominion over Xibalba, and just like Apuch, he was associated with owls and was represented as a petrified corpse. Last but not least was Buluk Chaptan. He wasn't as scary as the other gods of death, but he was far more brutal. He was seen as the incarnation of war, violence, and human sacrifice. He and Apuch were often depicted together. Buluk Chaptan was notorious for burning houses down and stabbing people with a spear. He held dominion over blood sacrifices and was closely associated with the number 11. King Yama. King Yama has a history that's almost as old as human civilization. He's known under dozens of names like King Yan, Yama, Yen Lo Wang, and Yama Raja. But regardless of what he's called, King Yama is feared as the heartless god of death across much of Asia even today. He is the Chinese god of death, but also a popular figure in Japan and India. Everywhere that Hinduism, Buddhism, or Taoism has ever spread, King Yama is known as a death god. It's believed that King Yama got his start in the ancient Sanskrit hymns of Hinduism. Then when Buddhism spread across East Asia and entered China thousands of years ago, his stories became entwined with local cultures and beliefs. This is why he has so many different names. He traveled across half the world, with his origin story morphing a little bit each time. For the Chinese, King Yama has always been depicted as a man with huge eyes. His eyes are so big because he can see the wrong inside a person's soul. His expression is usually one of malice, or of what might be considered judgment. 
It's always been his job to judge the evils of humankind. He even wears a judge's hat and traditional Chinese judge robes. King Yama is never depicted as a real monster. He's simply the judge who looks at every single person's soul upon their death. And in Chinese folklore, it's said that when somebody dies, they're brought to King Yama by his servants. Then he determines what will await them in the afterlife. He's also the king of the Ten Layers of Diyu, the Chinese version of Hell, similar to Shibalba and Hades, Anubis and Osiris. Earlier I mentioned the Egyptian god of death as being Osiris, but the truth isn't quite as simple as that. Anubis was also the Egyptian god of death. Osiris was more like the Jesus Christ of ancient Egyptian religion. Andrea Kucharek from Heidelberg University in Germany said that it would be a mistake to call Osiris the god of death. Andrea knows what she's talking about. She's been studying the millennia-old ritual texts of Osiris for years. Nowhere in the ancient scripts does it say that Osiris brought or caused death. Instead, he was seen as more of a ruler of the dead. He was also a god of life, associated with the fertility of all living things. For the Egyptians, Osiris was a very special deity. He died like Jesus Christ, then was resurrected, and it was his resurrection that made him a god of living plants, animals, and humans. At his very core, Osiris is the personification of springtime, just like many scholars argue Jesus is. You're likely wondering why people think Osiris is the god of death. It's because he was worshipped alongside death. Ancient Egyptians wanted to be resurrected upon their deaths just like Osiris, only in the afterlife, and this led to him being tied in closely with funerary rituals. Anubis, the jackal-headed god, wasn't exactly the god of death either. He was the god of embalming, which made him closely related to death, but he didn't rule over the underworld or anything like that. Egyptian mythology says that Anubis was the one who mummified Osiris after he died. So Anubis was also tied in closely with funerary rituals. The disappointing truth is that ancient Egyptians never worshipped a singular death god. There was no one entity that they believed commanded the forces of the underworld. Instead, there were many gods associated with various parts of death, from embalming to resurrection. Moors. The Romans had gods very similar to the gods of the Greeks, but they weren't carbon copies. For the Romans, they had their very own special goddess of death named Moors, and she was the personification of agony, darkness, and lifelessness. In Roman myth, Moors was the child of Nox, the very night itself. She also had a sibling named Somnus, who was the god and personification of sleep. The closest Greek counterpart to Moors would be the god Thanatos, who was basically the grim reaper. Hindu religion also has a goddess named Mara, who was essentially the Grim Reaper as well. Morris performed all the duties of a classical Grim Reaper. Without bias, she dragged away kings and peasants to the realm of the dead. She didn't personally kill them, but she was always there at their death to bring them to the gate of the underworld. Shinigami. The Japanese have their own versions of the Grim Reaper as well, but they aren't gods. In Japanese myth, the Shinigami are death gods or spirit. They are supernatural beings who didn't really enter Japanese folklore until around the 18th century. There are no records of these death spirits prior to 300 years ago. Historians suspect that it wasn't until Christian ideas began seeping into the Japanese borders that Shinigami were born. Prior to the 18th century, Japanese myth already had its own death goddess named Izanami. But once the concept of a grim reaper arrived, suddenly Japan was flooded with Shinigami. These spectral creatures are very similar to the reaper in modern American mythology, but with a twist. Instead of showing up to harvest souls with a giant scythe, Shinigami are there to make sure a person dies at the time that designated for them. They know exactly when every person is supposed to die, and they arrive at the specific time to make sure it happens. Then they escort the deceased person's soul into the afterlife. To be honest, they aren't even that frightening. Japanese myth says that the Shinigami are welcomed politely into a person's home. There isn't much reaping that happens. It's more of a quiet acceptance of death, with Shinigami gently guiding the dead into the great beyond. Thanks for watching! Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed! Jupiter Jupiter was the Roman equivalent of the Greek god Zeus. He was the king of gods, the god of the sky and thunder, and the main deity of ancient Rome until Christianity took over. Because he was so popular and powerful, the Romans named the largest planet in the solar system after him. 
Fun fact, the ancient Babylonians were the first people to record their sightings of the planet Jupiter. Jupiter was the son of Saturn, an agricultural god, and Ops, and his brothers were Neptune, the god of the sea, and Pluto, the god of the underworld. They were quite the trio, but Jupiter was the most powerful of his siblings. He carried an endless supply of lightning bolts and ruled by intimidation. Each god had a specific task, but Jupiter's role was vast. He assisted the kings in establishing the principles of the Roman religion, and Romans honored and prayed to Jupiter the most out of all the gods. Statues, temples, and relics were erected in his honor in their cities, and public officials took their oaths in his name. During wartime, he gave protection and could decide which side would be victorious. In peacetime, he was the god of justice. He was also busy with bringing light, keeping order, providing general welfare to the people, and taking care of everyone after death. Rome's Capitoline Hill was one of the biggest temples devoted to Jupiter. After major military victories, generals paraded through the city and onto the temple. As the Roman Empire evolved and changed, so did Jupiter's role. During the time of the emperors, they believed they were descendants of Jupiter himself. Then, with the rise of the Republic, competing factions would fight in the name of Jupiter in their quest to rule. Later on, he represented the past and the old kingship which many people were against. His image transitioned from that of an ultimate deity to one that represented the forbidden and deserving of punishment and scorn once the Romans became Christian. Juno Juno was the queen of the gods as well as Jupiter's wife and sister. Together with Jupiter and Minerva, she was one of the three original Roman gods worshipped in Rome. She appears as a statuesque woman of radiant beauty and with slightly militaristic features. In some depictions, she's shown with a peacock and wears a goatskin and carries a shield and spear, ready to help the armies in battle. From the outset, Juno represented all aspects of women's lives, especially marriage and childbirth. She became an important guardian and protective figure for the ladies of ancient Rome. Several temples were erected in her honor, including one on Esquiline Hill and another on Capitoline Hill. She is often compared to the Greek goddess Hera, although there are several differences. Juno was quite heroic and considered more peaceful and less vengeful than Hera. Over time, Juno's role eventually expanded to include more functions, making her the state's primary female deity and thus more like Hera. She came to be seen as a protector not only of women, but of the entire Roman Empire. The Matronalia was a celebration in Juno's honor that took place on March 1st and was marked by husbands giving gifts to their wives. It was also possibly a birthday celebration for her son, Mars, the god of war. She also guarded over the finances of the empire, and the month of June is named after her. Since she is the patroness of marriage, women, and childbirth, it is very fitting that the month of June is the most favorable time to marry. Minerva Minerva was the goddess of wisdom, medicine, the arts, and eventually war. Jupiter was her father and gave birth to her from his head. She was one of the three original Roman deities along with Juno and Jupiter. Ancient depictions of the goddess often show her donning military apparel such as a shield, belt, and helmet. Minerva was once closely associated with the Greek goddess Athena, but some scholars now believe that she was indigenous and inspired by the Etruscan goddess Minerva. The Romans admired Minerva for her chastity and for rejecting the advances of even the most desirable men, including Mars, the god of war. There were shrines to Minerva on the Aventine and Mons Caelius, two of the seven hills Rome was built on. Her importance to the Roman people grew over time, and she eventually superseded Mars as the focus of the Quinquatrus Festival, a five-day celebration that occurred in late March. Minerva eventually became synonymous with victory, as evidenced by a temple the politician and military leader Pompey built in her honor after his successful campaigns in the East, as well as a temple the Emperor Domitian commissioned after declaring the goddess to be his protectress. Neptune Neptune was the god of the sea. As you might remember from what I told you, his parents were the gods Saturn and Ops, the Earth Mother. Neptune had several siblings, including brothers Jupiter and Pluto and sisters Vesta, Juno, and Ceres. He was similar to the Greek god Poseidon and often appeared as an old bearded man carrying a three-pronged spear called a trident. At some point, Neptune also came to represent horse racing, most likely due to early depictions of him riding through the water in a horse-drawn chariot. He was known for his violent temperament and vindictive tendencies, which reflected the ocean's unpredictable nature. These traits occasionally got Neptune into trouble, including when he unsuccessfully tried to overthrow Jupiter. 
At a lack of scientific explanation for earthquakes, the Romans believed Neptune caused them when he was angry. Neptune also had a reputation as a ladies' man. In addition to the three kids he had with his wife Salacia, he fathered many more children through his extramarital affairs. Venus Much like the Greek Aphrodite, Venus was born from the sea foam and was the Roman goddess of love, sex, beauty, prosperity, and fertility. She was strikingly beautiful and was represented by many of the same symbols as Aphrodite, including roses and the evergreen shrub myrtle. Other symbols of Venus include the scalloped shell, dolphins, doves, mirrors, pearls, and pomegranates. Because of what she represented, new brides gave Venus their childhood toys and made other offerings to her before leaving their homes. Venus was extremely important to the Romans for other reasons. They believed that her son Aeneas was the ancestor of Rome's original founders, Romulus and Remus, essentially making Venus the mother of Rome. Julius Caesar claimed she was his direct ancestor and paved the way for various other politicians to favor her. Besides having a son named Aeneas, Venus was also Cupid's mother. She was married to Vulcan, the hideously ugly god of fire, who pulled her around in a golden carriage. On April 1st, a festival dedicated to Venus called the Veneralia took place. Her followers washed her statues and adorned them with flowers and myrtle wreaths. They also vowed to honor her by fulfilling the moral obligations of their marriages and asked for her advice concerning romantic and relationship issues. Venus eventually had three annual festivals in her honor, as well as numerous temples and monuments. Mars Mars was the god of war and ranked second in importance to his father, Jupiter. Son of Juno, too, some believed that Mars was the father of Rome's founders, twin brothers Romulus and Remus. He was represented by his sacred shield, the Ansile, and was often depicted wearing bronze armor, carrying a bloody spear, and riding a chariot drawn by fire-breathing horses. Other symbols of Mars include a vulture, dog, woodpecker, and burning torch. Mars was considered the protector of the Roman army and was highly revered by mortal men, despite having a reputation among the gods as difficult and argumentative. He loved violence and conflict and was called upon to aid Rome during times of war and bloodshed. Soldiers prayed to him for protection and victory before entering the battlefield. Mars' role as a protector during times of war extended past the battlefield and into civilian life. The Romans relied on him to protect their cities from invading forces and to quell rebellions. There were two annual festivals in honor of Mars, and most of the month of March was spent in his honor dancing, drinking, music, and feasts. Sounds like a fun time. Diana Diana was the goddess of the hunt and the Roman counterpart of the Greek Artemis. Jupiter was her father and her mother was his mistress, Latona. Her twin brother is Apollo, the god of light and music. Diana was born fully grown and was a tall, beautiful woman with a youthful appearance who wore a tunic and was usually barefoot. She was often depicted as looking between 12 and 19 years old and carrying a quiver and a bow. In addition to representing the hunt, Diana also symbolized wildlife, fertility, childbirth, chastity, and the moon. The Romans believed she could communicate with animals and even control their behavior. She was also known as the goddess of the woods. Although Diana swore never to marry and was associated with purity, women prayed to her for an easy childbirth and when they wanted to conceive, and she was highly respected among women for her role in fertility. Diana was highly intelligent and talented, but was also known to be vengeful and unpredictable at times. In one myth, she sent a pack of hounds after the hunter Actaeon accidentally stumbled upon her bathing in the forest. Nemoralia, or the Festival of Torches, took place in Diana's honor on August 13th, and some pagans still celebrate it today. It's a day of rest where all hunting is banned, and worshippers pray to the goddess for a bountiful fall harvest. Apollo As I mentioned before, Apollo was Diana's twin. He was known by the same name in both Greek and Roman mythology and was one of the most important and complex deities in ancient Rome. In Roman mythology, Apollo was mainly the god of prophecy and healing. He was also associated with light, knowledge, poetry, and art, and was represented by the golden lyre that Hermes created for him. Apollo was beardless, with a youthful and athletic appearance. He was graceful and beautiful, and his parents were proud of his good looks. In fact, Apollo's parents were the only gods who could tolerate his presence, as the other gods and goddesses feared him. You may or may not remember, but Apollo played a major role in the Trojan War, infecting the Greeks with a plague and helping Paris to kill Achilles. Despite his healing capabilities, Apollo could also inflict plague and poor health upon others. 
He was a busy god who also directed a choir, was the patron defender of flocks and herds, and served as an intermediary between gods and mortals, so very helpful to all of us. Apollo also had the gift of prophecy, which he received as a reward for his truthful nature. Life was not all work and no play for Apollo. He took on many lovers, although his relationships usually ended badly and had many children. In his spare time, he enjoyed attending drinking parties on Mount Olympus in the company of his beautiful muses and playing delightful tunes on his lyre. Thanks for watching! Which god or goddess is your favorite? Let me know in the comments below and let me know if you would like to learn more about ancient Rome. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you later. Bye!